Hi, this is Dr. A. Welcome to your first uh, microbiology lesson. We're going to just do an introduction to microbiology and talk a little bit about the microscope. Um, your lab in the next lesson will be a little bit more practical on the microscope, um, as practical as we can make it, being digital. Okay, so the first thing I want to do um, when you open up your Nearpod is I want you to answer this question. So. We all get sick at some point in our lives. Some illnesses are due to microorganisms and some are not. Create a list of five diseases that you believe are caused by microorganisms and then list the type of microorganisms that causes the disease. If you know the specific organism, you're welcome to list it, um, but I'm mostly interested in you knowing if that uh, organism is a bacteria, a virus, or fungus, or something like that. So make a list of five and enter your answers there. Okay, so let's talk about disease and microorganisms. So um, the in the last, I don't know, probably 100 years or so, we've made associations between non-infectious diseases and microbes. So these are diseases we that we once thought uh, were caused by something that was, you know, not a microbe. So, for example, gastric ulcers. Gastric ulcers, we thought, were just caused by stress and spicy foods. Well, now we know they're caused by a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori, which can live in stomach acid, which is, at first didn't think that anything could live at such a low pH. But in the scientific community there was wrong, medical community was wrong, and indeed, gastric ulcers are caused by a bacteria. Cancer has association with bacteria and viruses, uh, especially like long-standing infections, um, and especially some uh, in the vir viruses, some of the viruses that, that just don't go away. So for example, one of the ones that is more recent in its discovery is HPV and cervical cancer. So HPV is human papillomavirus, uh, and it is definitely linked to cervical cancer, and that's what that Gardasil vaccine is all about. And, uh, but it's not every strain of HPV, it's only just a handful of them. So, um, you know, that's another association between cancer and uh, viruses. And diabetes, uh, and this is type one diabetes, not type two. So type one diabetes is an autoimmune process. And there's a lot of autoimmune processes that have roots in viral infections. So um, this one, type one diabetes is linked with the Coxsackie virus, which causes a, um, Kind of a childhood flu-like symptom, usually a pretty mild um, type of infection. And then uh, schizophrenia is associated with the Borna agent also. So lots of viruses there. Okay, so um, microbes are everywhere. Even though we cannot see them, they actually do us more uh, good than harm. So tell, create me a pro and con chart you don't have to make it like a fancy chart. You can just list pros and then list cons, elucidating the positive and negative effects of microbes on human life. Uh, I want at least one pro and one con in uh, this discussion. So enter one pro, enter one con of microbes. Okay, so let's talk about the pros, a little bit some of the positive aspects of microbes. So microorganisms are the main forces that drive the structure and content of the soil, water, and atmosphere. Um, one of the, the people I follow on um, social media is Dr. Mark Hyman, and he talks about um, food production and stuff too. I mean, this is he's, he's a health person, but he's, what he's saying is, um, if you want to grow good food, you actually are a soil farmer because you want good, rich soil. And how do you get good, rich soil? You get good, good microorganisms, good variety of microorganisms in that soil. And that gives you a good, rich soil and gives you really good food. Anyway, microbes produce CO2, nitric oxide, and um, methane and stuff that insulate Earth's atmospheres. And uh, microorganisms are the most abundant cellular organisms in the oceans. Um, viruses are the most ab abundant inhabitant of the oceans. And there's something like, I don't know, like millions of viruses in just one drop of ocean water. Um, bacteria and fungi also live in close association with plants. And they help them obtain nutrients and fighting disease. Again, good, rich soil with a variety of bacteria and fungi gives you uh, good, rich, healthy plants. Okay, 
So here's a scenario. You sit down to lunch with a friend and you both eat a ham and cheese sandwich on sourdough bread with lettuce, tomato, and mayo with a small side salad made of greens, tomatoes, cucumbers, onions, topped with a vinaigrette dressing. You drink wine while your friend drinks beer. Uh, create a list of the products in this meal that would no longer be available if humans uh, to humans if microorganisms became extinct. So just think of um, which of these foods do our microorganisms involved um, in it coming to life or being produced? Okay, so then I want you to think of at least three more products that are not listed in this meal that would not be available if we did not have microorganisms. Okay, so let's continue on positive aspects of microbes. Um, the historical uses of microbes by humans are in bread production, alcohol production, cheese production, treatment of wounds and lesions, um, and genetic engineering. Uh, it manipulates the genetics of microbes, plants, and animals for the purpose of creating new products and genetically modified organisms. So those are GMOs. Um, there's a lot of controversy on GMOs. Um, so I would say probably for me the biggest highlight on the controversy is um, well, there's there's two actually. Um, one's more a humanitarian one. So if you genetically modify a seed, then it becomes proprietary, and the farmer has to buy seed from the company every year. Whereas um, before that, so if we went back before genetic uh, genetically modifying organisms and having to buy seed, a farmer could buy just seeds for the initial crop plants keep back part of the crop to get seed for for the next crop and just once they get going they're good to go but um if your seed is genetically modified then you can't do that because it's proprietary you have to buy it every year so that means farming costs more food costs more and all of that part of why do we do that is those genetically modified seeds are produced to create bigger yields and also be resistant to insecticides and pesticides and things like that which also means then that you can spray the crops pretty liberally with the insecticides and pesticides and not kill your crop. But then that means that when you eat GMO crops, you're eating uh, insecticide and pesticide laced um, crops. So for example, did you know like all your common cereals, um, I'm not gonna name any brand names, but pretty much if you walk down the cereal aisle and pick up any of the box, unless it's a non, uh, unless it's specifically labeled non-GMO or organic, um, that box, uh, the cereal in that box is going to be laced with glyphosate, which is round, Roundup. Um, it's not listed in the ingredients, no, but it's part of this, the, the grains that are harvested. So um, anyway, but we we can, it does allow for better crops and stuff like that. So there's pros and cons to GMOs. Uh, the recombinant DNA technology is a technology that makes it possible to transfer genetic material from one organism into another and deliberately alter the DNA. So in, one thing you have to know is they're mixing like plant and insect DNA and, and stuff like that. So it's not like they're taking some plant DNA and mix it with some other plant DNA. No, they're taking DNA sometimes out of animals and insects and stuff like that and put it in plant DNA. And some of that stuff, we don't really know like the long-term consequences of it. We don't know the long-term consequences on our health too, but it's out there and it's being done. Um, and they can also uh, be used in bioremediation. So um, bowel remediation uses microbes that are already pre present or they introduce them intentionally to restore stability or uh, clean up toxic polymers and this is in the environment. So some of the negative aspects, we talked about all the pros. Um, so obviously pathogens, uh, microbes can cause disease. We're in the middle of a pandemic currently, so we definitely understand that. Uh, viruses, but also bacteria and other things can cause disease. There are over 2,000 different microbes that can cause diseases in humans. There are 10 billion infections um, that occur across the world every year. That's more than there are people in this world. So. Um, infectious diseases are among the most common cause of death worldwide, and this is obviously, you have to think outside the United States, or if you go into 
uh, regions like Africa and India and Asia and stuff like that, um, where healthcare is not as prevalent and not, not as widely available, there are still a lot of people dying from infectious disease. It is no longer a top cause of disease in the United States, but it's not that far down the list though. Um, and then we have some emerging and re-emerging diseases. So AIDS is an emerging disease. So it, you know, kind of popped its head in the 80s and stuff. And um, hepatitis C, uh, definitely spreading. West Nile virus is a newer one. And then tuberculosis is a re-emerging disease. So it's a disease that was prevalent, kind of went away, and now it's coming back. Um, and we also have an increasing number of patients with weakened defenses. So um, they are subject to infections by common microbes that are not pathogenic to healthy people. So if you think about that, so we have, you know, the HIV AIDS uh, patients or AIDS patients anyway, they have weakened defenses, but anybody is taking chemotherapy for cancer, uh, people with autoimmune diseases and stuff like that, all of these um, people have weakened defenses. And, uh, are subject to infections with opportunistic, um, you know, infections um, that normally wouldn't, wouldn't should make you sick. Um, and then we also have, this is a really big problem, and you're going to be uh, writing on this uh, throughout this class, is there's an increase in microbes that are resistant to drugs. So drug-resistant bacteria is a really big problem because we're running out of um, antibiotics and stuff to treat them. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about cellular organization, uh, and we're going to go more in depth uh, on this as we progress through this class. So first, eukaryotic uh, organism. Eu means true, karyo means nucleus, so they have a true membrane-bound uh, nucleus as an organelle. And so eukaryotes are cellular organisms that have um, organelles, which are member membrane-bound structures that perform specific functions, such as the nucleus, mitochondria, the chloroplasts, and stuff. Some of those eukaryotes are microorganisms, and some are microscopic, which means that you can see them. So this little cute little kitty cat is actually a eukaryotic organism. We are eukaryotic organisms because our cells have a nucleus and has mitochondria and stuff like that. Uh, and so, but then this little guy, this is Georgia Lamlia, he's a unicellular, and these are actually not eyes, they are two nuclei, and uh, so he is a eukaryote, he has a membrane-bound uh, nuclei, it's a cellular, but it's unicellular organisms. And then you have bacteria and archaea, so these guys are 10 times smaller than eukaryotes, so like, take this guy, it's at least 10 times smaller here, so um, a little harder to see. And uh, we can't see them with the naked eye. These we can't see with the naked eye either. Obviously, these we can. Um, they do not have organelles. So um, these are prokaryotes. We are going to look at prokaryotes also during, um, obviously, this class because we're going to study bacteria. Uh, they, um, they are all microorganisms. None of them are micro scopic like a cat or whatever they're all little bitty 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 and um they are cellular they are so they have a cell membrane but they their genetic material is not in the confines of a membrane bound nucleus it's just genetic material just floating around in the cell in the cell cytoplasm they uh, don't have mitochondria they don't have endoplasmic reticulum chloroplasts or anything like that so no organelles and then you have viruses. Viruses are not cellular, and they're not independently living um, cellular organisms. So the thing with a with a virus is a virus by itself on a surface. For example, you you you, know, you cough and you have some maybe you have a flu or something, and some of the viruses gets on your on your computer there. Uh, the the virus itself on a computer does nothing it cannot replicate you can't get um, a growing colony or whatever of viruses that it just it just sits there um and the way it spreads is um so let's say i had a flu and i coughed on my computer 
And then my daughter came by and she said, hey, mom, can I use your computer? And I did not wipe down my computer or anything like that. And maybe I'm laying down because I'm not feeling good. And so she comes and she just uses my keyboard, types, types, looks something up, all of that. Maybe she prints something, whatever. And then she goes on and she didn't know. So she didn't wash her hands and she picks up something to eat, a cookie or something and she eats. And then so it goes in. Okay. And so then, and then she gets sick. So that's how, um, viruses transmit and why would she get sick well the virus can gain entry into her cells now once the virus gains entry into a cell it can use the cell to the cell's machinery to replicate its genetic material and its proteins and stuff like that but on its own it can't do nothing so it's really interesting um so it's it is basically somewhere between large molecules and cells it can command a cell it can it can take over a cell but um it can't like it doesn't it doesn't eat any food basically it doesn't create any kind of waste um it's just genetic material wrapped in a protein coat and sometime with an envelope called a you know a membrane we're gonna have a whole chapter on viruses we're gonna look at them and stuff like that um and um again it's it's inert it can it does nothing outside the host but uh, it does exist as a form of genetic material that can confer a partial genetic program inside the host so it can insert its genetics into your cell and then take over the cell and make a whole bunch of viruses and that's how it makes you sick it's actually the fact that whatever cell they can get in gets destroyed in the process of making more viruses and that causes the symptoms of illness All right, next opening question for you. So you have a cold and you go to the clinic to get some medicine. All the doctor can do for you is give you some decongestants and some cough suppressants because a virus causes cause your cold. Why were no antibiotics prescribed for this viral infection? So I want you to think about that and answer. All right. Um, what characteristic is a virus lacking so that it is considered a cellular is not a cell based organism so uh, tell me why why is that what is it lacking all right so your friend a germaphobe is constantly wiping everything down with antiseptic wipe can we not relate to this right now goodness uh, using Germex, she has antibiotic soaps everywhere in the house. Many people, like your friend, have a fear of microorganisms or germs. Uh, so this is definitely relevant right now in the area in the era of uh, coronavirus. But um, so, um, why do you think this is a realistic fear, and why do you think such a fear may be unrealistic? So do you realistic, unrealistic, um, antiseptic, everything or not? Uh, what are your thoughts? Okay, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm going to balance my phone here. Okay, discoveries of the golden age of microbiology. Um, so one of the first big ones was disproving spontaneous generation. So uh, the spontaneous generation was the belief that invisible life forces present in matter led to the creation of life. Um, so literally like stuff sprung out of rocks or whatever. So non-life could get rise to life, which is not compatible with the laws of nature and the laws of science. Um, even after the discovery of microbes, uh, the belief uh, in abiogenesis, so again, uh, the generation of life from non-life was still embraced by some scientists because it was just prevalent for a long time. Other scientists, though, advocated biogenesis. Uh, so it has the understanding that living things can arise only from other living things of the same kind, meaning that um, it's pretty simple, actually. If you have cat, a cat that's pregnant, the cat's going to have kittens, right? The cat's not going to have puppies. That's basically it. So, uh, but even in, in uh, microorganisms, um, if you pick up a uh, um, staph aureus microorganism and you put it on a plate, it's going to grow staph aureus organisms. It's not going to grow streptococcus. It's not going to grow pseudomonas or anything like that. Okay. And so uh, Louis Pasteur is who um, 
proved uh, for good the theory of biogenesis. Uh, any study the role of microorganisms in the fermentation of beer and wine, um, any proved biogenesis. And the way he did that, you have to go look up his, his um, stuff in the book. It's really interesting. But he took two flasks of, um, I think it was broth, and boiled them. And the flask had um, a, a beaker that, that bent. So basically what happened is that uh, the way the beaker was was bent at an angle like yeah like this, um, the de broth um, was boiling, the steam and everything could escape, but nothing could go back into the flask. Okay, so he basically sterilized the broth, and then on one of the flasks he broke it, and the 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 beaker and left and left it open, so things thing could uh, could fall down into the open beaker. And it grew a bunch of stuff and spoiled, but the one um, where the beaker was still bent and nothing could get in stayed sterile. Like it just, it stayed sterile all the time. And so um, that proved uh, the, the theory of biogenesis. So if you had nothing alive, nothing could um, generate itself from nothing. So, um, you know, you had to have bacteria and fungi that drifted and got into the broth in order for the broth to start growing the bacteria and the fungi and stuff. Uh, then the invention of the microscope uh, by Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek. Uh, so that was uh, the beginning of the discovery of all these little creatures that we cannot see but uh, with the naked eye. Um, and then we have Ferdinand Kahn, which discovered and uh, described heat resistant endospores. So, again, a little more progress um, on the you know, field of microbiology. Um, heat resistant endospores, um, you are familiar with if you're in the healthcare field, would be um, C. diff infections. So, um, that would be. Um, the, the spores is a uh, significant mega it's a spore can resist uh, in the environment for a very very long time can resist harsh environment but if you pick up a spore and it gets into you then as soon as it gets into you and has favorable environment to grow it gets out of the spore form and gets into uh, a form that's uh, capable of growing and causing infection Okay, um, Oliver Wendell Holmes and Ignace Semmelweis, they describe the importance of hand washing and preventing disease in a hospital setting. Their, their story is really, really interesting. So they made a correlation basically uh, and then, you know, induced uh, cause and effect of uh, the medical students that were going from autopsy to uh, delivering babies and then moms were, were dying all the time so back then giving birth in the hospital was really really risky because you had a high chance of dying because uh the doctors weren't washing their hands they were straight going from working on dead bodies to delivering babies and introducing bacteria and stuff into women and then the women were dying of massive infections and somebody said you know maybe we shouldn't go be going from dead bodies and live babies and stuff maybe we should stop and clean up wash hands and all of that and the when they implemented that the women quit dying so it's like ah, ha ha we're stumbled onto something and so again still to this day hand washing is one of the most effective ways to prevent yourself from uh, getting any kind of infection uh, Joseph Lister was the first to use aseptic techniques in surgery so an aseptic technique is a technique that is designed to not introduce uh, microbes and stuff you know in a site that was previously sterile or whatever so um, you know making sure you have clean equipment that's been sterilized and all that kind of stuff and then the germ theory of disease um, again that was a big advance um, between Louis Pasteur of course um, that proved biogenesis but he also invented pasteurization which uh, is um, heating things like milk and all that to, um, to up to a certain temperature not to boiling dough to kill microorganisms uh, so that the product lasts longer and is not infected or it doesn't you know cause um you know like uh have bacteria that would cause you to have you know gi infections and, stuff. and then uh he also started the first studies that linked uh human disease to infection but then Ro robert Koch is who did the, the 
the most. And he postulated a series of logical steps to establish whether or not an organism is pathogenic and what disease it caused. Um, his first one, he showed that anthrax was caused by Bacillus anthracis in 1875. So, um, you know, that was a lot of work linking symptoms, X, Y, Z, this syndrome presentation of, of symptoms and saw that with a specific bacteria. Okay, uh, so that was a lot of work from a lot of scientists linking these specific uh, bacteria to specific syndromes and stuff. All right, um, a patient comes to the ER, emergency department, uh, where you are working. He is feverish, has cold sweats, coughing up bloody mucus. You suspect he might have TB. Okay, so list some procedures and protocols you would use in relation to this potentially infectious patient that are based on discovery made during the golden age of micro. Okay, so just think about what would you do to prevent yourself from um, getting TB and from uh, how would you care for this patient based on what you've learned uh, in the last few slides. You can look in your book and stuff like that. Okay, so the, some of the more recent advances in microbiology. So we have the discovery of restriction enzymes in uh, the 1970s. Restriction enzymes um, can cut DNAs at certain um, base pairs, uh, certain code sequences, and if you use the same enzyme to cut at the same uh, site, you can swap the bits and you can you can basically cut and paste um, the, the genetic material from one one organism to another. So that is basically um, just discovering those that those existed um, and that we could use them to manipulate and to cut DNA and then into pieces and then also to, to uh, put them back together uh, in different orders and stuff like that. That was the beginning of uh, genetically modifying organisms and stuff like that. So very big, um, very, you know, very big discovery. Uh, another one is the importance of biofilms in infectious diseases. So that was 1980s and beyond. Uh, so knowing that uh, microbes can grow on surfaces and once they form a biofilm on a surface, um, it's just about impossible to treat it with a micro, um, um, sorry, with an anti antibiotic because the biofilm itself prevents the antibiotic from reaching the bacteria and stuff that are in the film, and so uh, very difficult to treat. This is uh, biofilms are the reasons behind um, changing IVs, changing indwelling catheters, and that kind of stuff. Is because we know that. If they're in their long term, they can form a biofilm, and um, that it's almost impossible to treat. That's why sometimes some uh, indwelling uh, ports and stuff that are put in patients may have to be changed out because if they get colonized and there's a biofilm there, it's just it's just no way to treat it. You have to pull the device uh, and put a clean one back in. Uh, the importance of small RNAs. So. Um, we're able to uh, sequence entire genomes, um, in, and so that you know started. Um, in, it's been a couple decades now, and uh, we know that DNA uh, can makes RNA, and RNA is uh, the message, message RNA, and all of that um, is what is used to make the proteins and stuff like that. But a lot of the RNA doesn't end up as a protein. And these pieces of RNA are small um, and uh, appears that they have critical roles in regulation. So within your DNA, you have recipes, but then you also have like basically instructions in uh, of what to do when or, or how much. So there, these small RNAs are, um, you know, part of the control mechanism. So that was, that's really interesting. Um, and then we have genetic identification of the human microbe. So that was 2010 and beyond. Uh, so this is a big, big, big area of study that's currently evolving. So um, we know that we are colonized with microbes from head to toe, from your hair to your skin to inside your mouth, your GI tract, your lungs, just every surface of you, even the ones that we once thought were sterile, have some microorganisms in them. 
Uh, they're supposed to be there. These guys are non-pathogenic. They can educate. They actually, uh, the ones that you get are part of uh, educating and training your immune system. Uh, and they play a huge uh, and important role in health. So your first discussion is going to be on the microbiome um, and um, just figuring out what what is a healthy microbiome, what is uh, a microbiome that uh, causes maybe disease or, link, or is linked to diseases and stuff. Uh, we know that the microbiome of people, for example, that have diabetes is different from healthy people. We know uh, some of the ones that have autoimmune diseases is different from healthy people and stuff like that. And so how do we begin to characterize that, to analyze it, and then could, you, could we treat you by simply fixing your microbiome? Very interesting, very interesting stuff. So uh, a quick review on macromolecules and their functions. So if you've had anatomy one, you should be good on this. Uh, but your big macromolecules are your, your big building blocks. So you have in your carbs, you have your monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. So a monosaccharide is anywhere from a three to a seven carbon sugar. A disaccharide is two monosaccharides put together, and a polysaccharide is a bunch of monosaccharides put together. So a monosaccharide is a simple sugar. An example would be glucose and fructose. A disaccharide would be, for example, maltose uh, and lactose uh, and sucrose. And then a polysaccharide would be starch, cellulose, and glycogen. Um, your lipids are your next important building block. Uh, you have triglycerides, phospholipids, waxes, and steroids. Um, triglycerides are three fatty acids in uh, glycerol, and they're in your fats and oils and stuff. Your, uh, and it's also what you store as extra energy. Your phospholipids are fatty acids, glycerol, and uh, phosphate. There's only two fatty acids in that one. They're all the components of your cell membranes and bacterial cell membranes and fungal cell membranes and all of that. Uh, your waxes are fatty acids and alcohol, like mycolic acid. They're part of the cell wall of certain bacteria. And your steroids have a ring structure. Um, they're cholesterol or ergosterol, or, or and these are stabilized membranes and stuff. Then you have your proteins, the third uh, building block. Uh, they're chains of amino acids, um, and they make up uh, enzymes, which uh, facilitate chemical reactions. They make up parts of cell membranes, parts of cell wall. They make up ribosomes or antibodies or a bunch of stuff. And when you're looking at us, uh, things like your hair is made of protein, a protein called keratin and stuff. And um, when you look at a person, there's a lot. You're actually looking at a lot of protein and stuff. But our muscles have proteins, our bones and stuff. Um, and there are so proteins are always structural components, and but they also perform metabolic reactions, obviously with the enzymes. Your nucleic acids or uh, the nucleotides are the building blocks of your DNA and RNA. They're made of a sugar phosphate and a nitrogen based. Uh, and your bases are your purines or adenine and guanine. And your pyrimidines are cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Um, so with that, you can build DNA and RNA. All right, next open-ended question. One of the new frontiers of microbiology is to figure out the role of all the microbiomes that are on and in us. This started with Human Microbiome Project. So tell me quickly, type up, what is a Human Microbiome Project and why is understanding human microbiome so important? So why are they putting a bunch of funding in this? All right, next question. Um, amino acids are building blocks of which ones? Next question, a monosaccharide is a building block of which one of these? All right, so let's talk a little bit about microbial sizes. Um, so this one is going to be a little bit harder for you to get your head wrapped around because we're not going to be able to um, really do a lot of hands-on with a, with a microscope. But um, the dimensions of microscopic organisms, such as um, yourself or insects, or even think small things like ticks and mosquitoes and stuff, can be given in centimeters or even millimeters uh, in meters. Um, these are um, standard measurements and stuff like that. I know you probably are not used to thinking in centimeters and meters, but that scientific measurement uses, uh, you know, 
centimeters and meters and stuff like that. So uh, a, cent a centimeter, sorry, is, a, is about this big. Um, like your height would be measured in meters. So you'd be one meter, and, I don't know, 70 centimeters or something like that, or two meters or something like that. So microscopic organism, small organism, will go from millimeters, that would be the biggest measurement, which is a tenth of a centimeter, so whoop, like hair, like tiny, to micrometers. Um, so a millimeter is a tenth of a centimeter. A micrometer is uh, a one thousandth of a millimeter, and a nanometer is a one thousandth of a micrometer. So uh, we're going, you know, three, you know, thousand times smaller each time. So um, a protozoa and an algae can measure three to four millimeters. So if we look on this um, scale here, this is centimeters. So this is zero. This is one centimeter, two centimeters, and to give you like two point four, I believe, right here. So about up to here, right, well, here it is in red. That is one inch. Okay, so I give you, if you're used to inches, kind of give you that uh, relationship. And so we're talking about three to four millimeters, so we go one, two, three. So this is three millimeters right here. This is four. So protozoas can, and algae can measure as big as a few millimeters. Um, but then your smallest bacteria measure around 200 nanometers, so it would be like a fraction of what you can see here. You can see it with a naked eye. And a virus is measured between 20 nanometers and 800 nanometers. So much, much, much smaller than we can see. As a matter of fact, with some of the smallest bacteria and um, the viruses, you can't even see them with a light microscope. So to give you the relationship sizes, so this is a red cell, uh, 10,000 nanometers in diameter. Uh, and so this would be a bacteria in relationship to a red cell. And then if you take that bacteria and blow it up, this is E. coli bacteria, which is 1,000 nanometers by 3,000 nanometers. In relationship to it, we have little viruses here. Smallpox, which is one of the bigger viruses, 200 nanometers by 300 nanometers. You have tobacco mosaic virus, only 50 nanometers by 300. A bacterial phage, um, polio and stuff like that. So only 30 nanometers. So if you look at the relationship of the sizes, it's quite, quite smaller. So we need electron microscopes to see these guys right here. Okay, so here are again the scales. So microscopic, you can see with the naked eye, uh, a louse, um, they're at least one millimeter or bigger, uh, reproductive structure zone, bread mold, and stuff like that. Now, uh, if you use a microscope that you find in your average scientific lab, um, even average clinical lab, you can see red cells, uh, you can see algae, uh, you can see most bacteria um, that are uh, between 1 and 10 micrometer in size. So all the way down to the E. coli bacteria and stuff. But then once you get smaller than 1 micrometer and you get into the nanometers, uh, for example, like mycoplasma bacteria and then viruses and stuff like that and DNA, then you have to use an electron microscope. So electron microscopes aren't just running around. They're pretty expensive structures. Uh, we don't have one uh, at Black River. I don't really, I don't think we have one at A-State. They probably have one in Little Rock, um, but it's not... Uh, it's not something that's regularly used. So we always, um, when we do microscopy, we're operating here at this level here. <clears throat> so here is your average microscope that you would see in a scientific lab. So um, you will have to do an exercise where you label these and put one of your labs. So um, let's just start at the top. We have the oculars, the eyepiece. Uh, sometimes there's one, sometimes there's two. And these are usually adjustable to your, to your, you know, because not everybody has the same setting for the eyes, right? Some people are closer together, wider, so you can move these, right? Um, so that you can see better. Okay, and they're hooked onto the body right here, and uh, there's the nose piece. So you have eyes and nose, and then here's the arm. Um, and so arm is just like holding the the body here in that nose piece and then the nose piece has objective lenses attached to it 
the objective lenses, there's usually three or four on a microscope, uh, will give you different magnifications uh, to be able to see what's on the slide. And it can, uh, you can rotate them, so you can actually move it and rotate them. Okay. Then you have uh, a mechanical stage. So you have really, th this is the stage right here, and then these little things here are mechanical, as in these things want hold the slide, and you can move this structure back and forth, uh, and you're using these stage adjustment knobs right here, going uh, side to side and back and forth. And that allows you to look around the slide and move it around and stuff. Okay. Uh, and then um, you have right here coarse and fine adjustment knobs. So when you're at a lower magnification, so a 4x or 10x, you're going to use your coarse. And what the course adjustment is going to move the stage up and down, okay? And so um, you're going to be moving it up and down, and um, that's going to allow to quickly bring the slide in focus. When you move it up and down, you need to be looking into the oculars to see what you're doing, okay? Once you've got it focused at uh, 4x or 10x magnification, you want to go to a bigger magnification, you can only use a fine adjustment knob because um, if you use the course, you will lose your focus very quickly because you move the stage too much. <clears throat> the fine adjustment knob just barely moves the stage up and down <clears throat> a little bit to allow you to focus on your slide. All right, and then underneath here is um, the light. So we have um, the base here with a light source, okay? And so you have a bulb in there, and this is this turns the light on and off and adjusts the intensity of the light. And the light is shining here. There's a field diaphragm level where you can uh, allow more or less light through here. And then there's a diaphragm control here, and it, it looks like um, it opens and closes an aperture that kind of looks like the eye of a camera lens, if you've ever seen it. It goes like this. So wide open will be allowing the most light as possible in and then uh, the, the more and more you close it the more kind of like the focus the light is but also the less of it is allowed in um, and so this is attached to the condenser um, and it condenses the light onto the slide so these are all the basic components of a microscope and this is just a light microscope so let's talk a little bit about magnification. Magnification occurs in two phases. So the real image is formed by the objective. So you have the slide and you have something on there and the image of that is picked up by the objective and it sends it up. And then it actually hits the mirror and then goes to the um, ocular. And so what you're actually looking at is a virtual image. So, um, the image is projected through the body and then bounces up because as you see, you're not looking straight down at the slide, you're looking at an angle. So there's a mirror in there. And so you're looking at, it's like looking at stuff in the mirror. So what is um, interesting with that is that what you're looking at is actually flipped from what you're actually seeing. And uh, one of the tricks when you learn to use a microscope is when you, you make the slide, for example, move towards you. When you're looking at it in a microscope, it's moving away from you. So it's doing the opposite. If you move the slide to the right and you feel uh, that you're looking at it, it's moving to the left. So you have to do stuff backwards and it takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then an image is, is flipped. So um, let's talk about total magnification. So the ocular magnifies the image 10 times. Uh, so that's the, the two eyepieces you, you look at. So they, they magnify 10 times. And then the objective lens, um, it depends on which one you're using. So uh, the lowest uh, magnification on an objective lens is 4x, so four times. Uh, and that is called the scanning, scanning objective. And that is usually the first one that you use to kind of get a, a first quick focus on your slide. So your actual magnification would be 40 times because it's a four um 4x magnification here times, so 4 times 10 is 40, okay. Then the next one is a 10, 10x, it's called low power. Again, very easy to focus, uh, and on this one, you get 100 times magnification, so it's 10 times 10, you get 100 magnification total. Then your next one is 40, so that's your Hydra objective, 
uh, this is where you have to start using a uh, fine focus. Uh, at 40 with a high draw, you can see white cells and red cells and stuff like that, and you can see algae and other other cellular structures. Um, the magnification is going to be 40 times 10, it's going to be 400 mag magnification. And then uh, the oil immersion, and this is called oil immersion because you actually have to put some oil on the slide and put the objective into the oil. Um, and it's going to be 100x times 10, so it's going to be a thousand times magnified. This is what you need. You have to have uh, the oil immersion objective lens in place to be able to see bacteria. You will not be able to see them at the high draw, at least not the individual bacteria themselves. So, um, again, when you look right here, you can see actually, so we have the light source, which is bounced here, con uh, condensed here, so it goes up, it's condensed and shot through the slide. This is the real image right here of the slide, but because it is bounced, the virtual image is flipped from it, okay? And uh, again, so you know, moving the slide, it's backwards and it is sometimes confusing. So you can see what's going on when you are you're looking at some here on the slide. Okay, so what is resolution? Reson resolution is also known as resolving power. It's basically how sharp the image is. So is a capacity of an optical system to distinguish or separate between two adjacent objects or points from one another. Um, the resolving power of the human eye is 0.2 millimeter. And the resolving power of a power of a light microscope using the oil immersion is 0.2 micrometers. So this would be low resolution. You can see pixels and blocks and stuff like that. It's very easy to distinguish one pixel from the other. This is a high resolution image. This is very hard to distinguish one little pixel from the other. Okay, so again, here's a low resolution image. Uh, in terms of microscopy, and this is a high resolution image. So obviously, high resolution does make it easier for you to see uh, details and stuff like that. And so, high resolution microscopes are going to be more expensive than low resolution microscopes. Okay, so which microscope will give you a picture with the most detail? Pick your answer. Um, and a little bit about why you have to use oil on the oil immersion lens and it has to do with directing the light rays uh, of the um, you know that's coming through through the condenser through the slide um, you can capture more light rays with the oil because it's um, there's no refraction going on so refraction is bending of the light when it goes from one type of surface to another or one type of material to another and so basically putting oil allows for a continuous stream of the light beam through whereas when it's air uh, some of the light can be refracted, which at a lower magnification is not as much of a problem, but if you're trying a higher magnification, we found that using the oil gives you a sharper image uh, because uh, more of the light can come through and allow for a higher resolution. Um, so uh, contrast in a microscope again is important. Is uh, So we have the refractive index um, is the degree of bending that light undergoes as it passes from one medium to another again uh, illustrated in this picture here okay this is light bending air because it goes from one surface to another uh, whereas oil kind of fixes that uh, the higher difference in the refractive index is the more bending of the light uh, the sharper the contrast measured by the microscope in the eye um, so there you go so if you can if you can get basically if you can get bend more light into your objective and not lose it right so we're bending more rays into the objective but we're not bending rays away from the objective more light coming in better picture refraction that bad refraction where the light where the light is bounced off and lost we don't see it as well okay the iris diaphragm, um, so if you have too much light, it can reduce the contrast. The way you know you have too much light is if you um, look through the, the, you know, the, eye, the oculars and it's like 
hurting your eyes and it's blinding you and it's just so bright you just can't see you have too much light okay and so um you can use the iris diaphragm to decrease that or increase that generally at the lower magnification you need less light and at the higher magnifications you need more light uh but if you have it on full blast and you look at it on, on their low magnification is going to blind you and so you can uh, use the iris diaphragm to control the amount of light that comes into the condenser also if you uh, look at it like a wet mount or something like that if you, you lose uh, use a lower amount of light you're going to see more contrast between the structures it's going to be easier for you to see um, things that are floating around in the water or in the urine or whatever it is you're looking at so it increases the contrast which is the difference between the light and the dark Okay, so um, you're gonna go to, um, you're gonna play with a virtual microscope on here. Let me see. Uh, sorry, let me enable my flash player and see, double check here. Okay, so this virtual microscope Welcome. is part of, I'm gonna close it, is part of your a virtual microscope lab and you're going to play with that so you're going to do a tour and you're going to do some of those exercises and stuff you don't have to do that right now it's going to be an assignment okay so uh here's a comparison of the types of microscopy so we have bright field and dark field with the bright field this is what we're you're typically used to you have a, a bright a light and then you have um the 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 slides can be stained or unstained but you you'll be able to see uh, darker objects on the light background or stained colored objects on the light background if you use dark field you're going to be look at look looking at light objects on a dark background okay so uh phase contrast um allows you to see things like crystals and all that the way they refract light um and so that's a different type of um microscope that we do see use in crystal analysis in the clinical lab and it allows to to see structures also within the cell so um all those uh, clinical labs can have phase contrast microscopes um i've not seen them in most teaching labs most teaching labs just have your bright field microscopes um you have differential interferences also it's um similar to the phase contrast uh where it can allow you to see um um, specimens uh, details and stuff like that um, that uh, would not be visible in bright field all right and then uh, fluorescence microscope um, uses UV light um, to allow for fluorescence uh, so but in order to use those you have to use the proper dyes to uh, be able to pick up obviously on the fluorescence and stuff uh, and then confocal ones um, are is a scan and confocal microscopes uh, is um, can see like really really cool contrast on like micro, my, uh, myofibrils and stuff like that um, so not used widely um, you see the resolution here they're all pretty similar but not used widely either more research based and then your electron microscopes uh you have the transmission electron microscope and the scanning um, electron microscope um, this is what you can um, use to see viruses and their viral structures and stuff like that so uh, again resolution much smaller than that of the other um, microscopes that use bright field or dark field or here using your, uh, these fluorescent and confocal using uh, ultraviolet light uh, whereas the other ones use uh, traditional Full, spe full spectrum light okay so question yeah so that is your last slide so um, this isn't any question slide so there will be one of these at the end of each lesson so if you have any questions pertaining to the lesson the chapter any of the material anything that you're confused about you're welcome to put it here while you're here like think about it just tap it up I will be reviewing uh, your lessons one for completion because you need to complete through these lessons uh, to get your attendance points uh, but I'll also be looking at the uh, answers that you give and I'll be looking at uh, this last screen here and looking at any of your questions and 
uh, I usually answer those in form of announcements um, in your um, so keep an eye on your announcements forum and uh, you are also welcome to always um, email me or send me a Moodle message with any kind of questions that you have okay so this is your first lesson um, I hope you enjoyed it and I'll talk to you soon